All right. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everyone here today. Thank you for joining us uh, in Effective Curriculum Design and Development, Outcome-Based Education Approach. Our speaker for today is Associate Professor Dr. Aisha Aubaka from University Malaysia Pahang. A little bit about our speaker today. Associate Professor Dr. Aisha Aubaka earned her PhD in Geotechnical Engineering from University of Manchester in 1999. She later joined University Malaya as a lecturer in the Department of Civil Engineering, Faculty of Engineering. She was actively involved in curriculum development and quality assurance beside her research work in geotechnical engineering. Her passion in for teaching and learning with quality assurance experience has led her to receive the National Teaching Award for Engineering Cluster in the first National Academic Award 2006 by the Ministry of Higher Education. Later, she was awarded the Chancellor Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2007 by the University of Malaya. Her exposure to good practice in teaching and learning was due to her active involvement in curriculum development at the program and institutional level. She let, uh, later expanded her contribution in this area by becoming an expert panel and contributed to the publication of national guidelines to good practices, curriculum design and delivery by the Malaysian Qualification in GC and QA. Apart from CGD, she was involved in researching assessment in higher education. She is currently active in developing others via continual academic staff development program in the area of assessment, curriculum design and delivery, scholarship of teaching and learning, and to you to I. She joined Uistim Malaya Pahang. She joined Uistim Malaysia Pahang in 2020 and was appointed as the director at the Center of Instructional Resources and E-Learning. She contributed to the development of UST e-learning ecosystem framework, substitute blended learning and micro credential. She is currently with the faculty and involved in the various staff development training programs at institutional and national and international level. Without further ado, all the way from Brisbane, Australia, let's welcome Associate <laughs> Professor Dr. Aisha Obaka. Uh, thank you, Umu. Although you are under the um, account of Linda, is it right? Right. Right. Okay, thank you so much and uh, a very good morning to, to all participants from University of Malaya. Um, I'm currently at uh, Queensland University of Technology, QUT uh, Brisbane, Australia. Uh, and I'm currently visiting a fellow at the Faculty of Engineering. Um, although I'm a visiting fellow at the Faculty of Engineering, my uh, basically sabbatical uh, program here um, at Brisbane is actually on um, higher education. Specifically, I'm looking at the uh, assessment in higher education and also on the curriculum design and also development. So I will share with you some of my experience that I um, recently uh, have here in Brisbane. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I will um, help you up with um, all the requirements on the curriculum design and also development as um, what is needed um, by the Malaysian College Qualification Agency and also by the Department of Higher Education. Right, before we begin, um, thank you Umu for the long bio data, um, but I think uh, I will introduce uh, myself first to you um, because maybe uh, a few of you are not quite familiar with me. I've seen one or two that I'm quite familiar. Ang Liluan, are you here? <laughs> Can I hear something from you? No? Or is this not the uh, Ang Liluan that I used to know back then in University of Malaya? By the hi, way. Hi, Aisha, sorry. Multitasking here, don't want to make it to, you can see the background size of my PC. Yeah. <laughs> Multitasking this morning. <laughs> nice to see you, sorry. 
Yeah. All right. All right. So thank thank you yeah, for yeah. joining us today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's just uh, great to have somebody that. Busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great to have somebody that um, I know and um, I, I feel very connected to University of Malaya because I've I've been with University of Malaya for twenty years. But uh, while I was in University of Malaya, I have been seconded to the Department of Higher Education twice. Um, as the director uh, of the academic um, management division, they call it. Uh, and uh, my main role at the at, at that particular division is actually looking after 20 public university on an all higher education policy regarding uh, academic matters. So all uh, academic programs uh, that are currently offered uh, in public university in Malaysia um, is is indeed uh, are indeed under the approval or uh, approval process by uh, the department that uh, I was with uh, at the uh, Ministry of Higher Education. So that is how uh, I got the um, privilege to run. Um, effective curriculum design and development for University of Maya and also for some other university as well, uh, including the Malaysian Qualification Agency, um, where this topic is normally given to me. I think um, the, the reason being, um, I will be able to share um, what are the things that um, the ministry is actually looking at when you submit new program for approval and um, what MQA exactly uh, look at when you submit a program for approval from the MQA. Uh, at the same time as well, um, because of my background in quality assurance and also um, in the curriculum development, um, uh, I hope that I will be able to share with you uh, quite a lot of things about how the curriculum need to be uh, developed and also implemented in its uh, full manner so that uh, everything that we do is effective rather than we do for the sake of uh, getting um, approval from either the MQA or also from the ministry. So my, my aim is not to help you to fulfill the MQA and also the um, basically the uh, ministry requirement, but at the end of the day, uh, we, we hope that from this session, we'll, we will be able to do it uh, for, the, for the right and honest purpose. Uh, that is for our learners. Right, so I'm not sure whether we have the luxury of time to go through uh, an introduction for each and every one of us. Would you like to quickly, do you think you'd like to quickly say your name? And and uh, where are you from? Is, is it okay we go through that first before we jump into uh, what we have to go through today for the next four hours? Anybody like to introduce yourself? I have the list here. Uh, at the beginning, Umu actually gave me like only 10 uh, participants altogether and I was quite happy with that number. Uh, because um, you see, when I thought that there's only 10, then we can be very intimate and we can actually go through according to your so-called wish list. Uh, but now I think we have more than 10. Um, I'm just going to say out um, names here. Uh, is it okay? We have Dr. Wan Shaf Shafa Sh Shafwani from, from engineering faculty. Yeah. And we have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Lau Kahin from Science Faculty. And we have Dr. Chin Sekpeng from the Pharmacy Faculty. And we have Ms. Asia Hassan, uh, Assistant Manager of UMZ. And um, I, I actually asked Umu whether we should um, attack this, um, basically this workshop at the program level or at the subject level, because when, it, when we talk about curriculum, there are at least several levels uh, that we can uh, go through. Uh, but I think with the uh, list that I have and with the combination of participants, uh, it is worthwhile for us to go through 
at least at two levels. One is at program level and one is at the subject level because there are uh, several of you who are actually in charge of the quality assurance uh, of the programs under your um, basically under your either your department or under under your center. And we have Prof Aruni from dentistry, a visiting professor. Prof Aruni, are you here? Are you here, Prof Aruni? No? <laughs> yes. And we have uh, Dr. Yong, you know. Um, we have Dr. No Hayati from Dentistry. Uh, Dr. Chui Ping Li. Yep, we morning, have. Uh, I'm here. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> for say hi to everybody. We have Dr. Um, we have Miss. Is it Dr. Miss Nazra? From you, set. You here? We have two executives. Uh, we have one executive and also one assistant manager from you, set joining us. We. <laughs> oh, great! <laughs> you you collaboratively both in the same room. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Go so please, please. Ah, nanti bagi tahu apa yang nak tahu, especially at the program level, nanti eh? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Are you are you basically um, coming up with new programs, or you you come here to look at how things need to be done and how curriculum review? So you come for for knowledge on how to do the review. Okay. Uh, the only difference about the review and also this uh, particular workshop uh, is that with curriculum review, obviously you have existing data for you to look at and your existing data will inform um, how much review you need to do but after uh, you have uh, got that data that you need to review either minor or major then you still have to do the same full cycle of curriculum design and development uh, I, I will i will go through with you all the four stages of curriculum design and development so that when you review and you come up with a new curriculum either with major or minor revision then you 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 will re, you will come up with this new curriculum in in a proper manner going through all the four processes yeah new thank you so much for joining us all right all right so you i think you come to the right place thank you <laughs> right so we have also uh pm dr um uh, no 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 from api yeah from api and we have um i've seen prozoria prozoria are you from yeah prozoria? I'm you are from which faculty? Okay, let me show you my face. <laughs> okay, that's me. You Maria. look so familiar. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, formerly from uh, faculty uh, from Department of Pharmacy and the uh, Faculty of Medicine. Um, now I'm honorary professor uh, in Faculty of Medicine, uh, but currently I'm also working as a dean in Massa University, and I'm looking after. Uh, about 10 programs, mm. yeah, 10 program, uh, pharmacy program and, and also bio uh, medicine program mm. and biotechnology program. So mm. I, I'm really interested actually uh, <laughs> to really learn, you know, how to like develop a, a curriculum because mm. I'm pressured to come up with another new program. New program. All right, that's great. That's great. I, I will I will try and address how we going to come up with a new program. Um, although the time given for us is only four hours, normally when we talk about effective curriculum design, development and also delivery, if if we go through this program in Singapore, it will take you 10 days. Uh, but if you are doing it with MQA, you will only, they, they normally give me one one whole day. And uh, ADAC is actually giving me four hours. So, <laughs> so uh, For effectiveness, uh, how, how long do you need? Uh, one week or three days? Um, 
if if it's a true workshop with with the with the actual uh, with the actual activities so that people can really uh, use it again and again uh, all those activities i think the the least if singapore do it in 10 days i think we can do it like in in full five days that would be good but if we can't uh, have that five days then i think two days um, should should be good enough so that we can go into detail but today we're just going to go through um you know, um, through, we will go through the uh, only two two of those processes. Uh, I'm going to omit uh, the third and also the fourth process that it processes that is the uh, implementation and also the evaluation. Um, and MQA normally also um, they offer the um, evaluation part uh, that is a curriculum uh, review. Um, uh, and uh, another um, workshop um, on the implementation part, they normally also offer it under uh, another workshop. But in, in actual, the whole process of curriculum design, uh, development, delivery will actually take all those four stages um, in total. Yeah, I'm, I'm like actually <laughs> you for five days, you know, like to invite you yeah. to Matsa and, and no to problem, the problem. process um, for us. Yeah. Uh, what what time will uh, when will you uh, return to Malaysia? I'll I'll be back in August. Um, so it, there will be like two and a half months left for me here yeah. to to really uh, have a look at how their how effective their curriculum uh, is. I'm actually quite surprised to learn that you have joined uh, UMP. Uh, you see, we, when we were talking about curriculum, I always have you in mind. You know, even though <laughs> thank you, bro. <laughs> But I heard a lot about you, um, uh, you know, the person uh, doing curriculum, lah. Yeah. I, okay. I have a lot to I have a lot to offer to everybody, um, uh, and I do hope I will get a chance to offer uh, a lot of things that I've learned, um, not only in Brisbane but in in many places, including like Finland, Canada, and all that. Because I've been those places and I've done benchmarking in in ASEAN country. Um, but it it all depends on on whether uh, people know how much I can help them or give them. And I think after August, when I go back, I would I would love to to offer myself to any institution who need help and also consultation. So thank you, Prof, for joining us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I think we have our Dr. Susanna. And also, Dr. Ng Lee. Ng Lee Luan, you have say hello to me. Uh, uh, Dr. Noor, Noor, Noor Azrul Azam. Noor Azrul Azam? Uh, Dr. Aisha to Azrul Edek. Azrul Edek. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, uh, we have uh, Nurul Huda. Dr. Nurul Huda. And we have... Dr. Yap Ling Langli, Dr. Yap Langli, yeah. Hi, and Prof. Hi. <laughs> Good to have you here. And we have uh, Dr. Azli and also Dr. Cecilia. Right. Okay. Although um, some I know you M staff are very shy. They are not switching on their camera. I'm sure you all have a well presented uh, outfit, and and you just you just being shy to to actually open up your camera. Okay, um, so I have given you the link to the material. I have trimmed some of the material down from the previous um, session that I had with ADAC because um, we we found that four hours is simply just inadequate to go through the whole process of curriculum design and also delivery. Uh, so I'd like to share with you, let me share my screen. Kalau tak ada Prof Aruni, Prof Aruni is our visiting professor and I'm not sure Prof Aruni is actually from which country. Is it okay if I speak a little bit of Bahasa from time to time? Is it okay with everybody? Yeah. Uh, All right. I'm sorry, uh, I'm from Korea. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, right. Okay. How, do I, how, do I, I, how do I pronounce your name? Young and No. Young, young and No. Young yes. 
All right, no problem. So I'm sorry, I cannot speak. <laughs> It, it's okay, it's okay, it's perfectly fine. Okay, can everybody see my, uh, thank you, Dr. Yong. Okay. Is it okay if I call you Dr. Yong? Sorry? If I, is it okay if I call you Dr. Yong? Yong? Yes, Yong? yes. All yes, right, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, um, in your folder, you should be able to get your slide, uh, which I label it as number one, and I also give you some references, uh, like um, I know that you can get this from the internet and from the MQA webpage. Uh, I, I give you COPA, COPA 2, um, to, uh, 2017 uh, edition, and I also give you um, a steep analysis, um, a template, and also a little bit of explanation or reference on a steep analysis. We're going to use this um, steep analysis later on. And I also provide you with the uh, World Economic Forum future job uh, document recently uh, released. This is the prediction of future job, uh, and this document is for the 2023 and you will be able to see um, how we can later, we'll discuss with you how we're going to use all these documents in our curriculum uh, uh, design and also delivery. And uh, I also provide you with the uh, most important document, especially if you are from the public university, but if you are not from the public university like Prozora, um, Document number three is the main document that we use in order for us to get approval for new programs or if we would like to actually do our curriculum uh, review, we, we need to actually refer to document number three that is Garis Panduan Pembangunan Program Academic Version 2, uh, which I um, personally have direct um, contribution to the development of um, document number three. Um, and uh, I also provide you with a folder um, labeled as number five. Um, this is actually a collection of um, slides uh, from Taklimat Guna Tenaga, we call it. This is actually uh, the briefing, um, a briefing program um, organized by the Department of Higher Education, Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia. Uh, and all the slides uh, has been presented by the representative from the various agency and also from the, mini from the ministry. Um, uh, and how we're gonna use these slides in our forecasting what will be there in future uh, will be discussed uh, in the first part of our um, training program today. So I hope uh, everybody is settling down uh, with all the uh, materials that we're going to use today as you can actually uh, download and keep it for you to, to use. Uh, and for your information, those who have uh, gone through my workshop, um, especially uh, with the MQA, um, although they have been you know going through my um, material for quite some time so whenever that they need to design new curriculum for their university normally they they contact me personally either via email or whatsapp and ask me whether there is new materials on how to do forecasting and for your information uh, then the new material for you uh, to do your forecasting in whether to offer or not to offer new programs that you intend to offer will be uh, those uh, in uh, folder number five uh, and perhaps will be uh, the uh, World Bank um, input uh, or document or the World Economic Forum document. So um, I normally uh, have those latest uh, documents with me so feel free after you left this uh, workshop if you have the need to uh, find uh, new documents um, please contact me and I, I will try my best and help you out uh, with uh, the new documents that you need right so let us begin with our workshop today um, and um, 
although I have not got the chance to hear from each and every one of you, um, but um, I think uh, some of you has ha has put up the reason why you are here. Because some of you said that you would like you would like to learn something, you would like to learn how to effectively design a curriculum, and some of you are in a position where you need to uh, guide and help your colleagues on how to develop new programs or uh, review existing programs. So I will touch on those. Um, to uh, in a minute, right? So we hope that at the end of the session, uh, because everything is in OBE format, so I have to walk the talk. So before we begin, I'll just have to declare that we hope that at the end of these four hours, we're going to be able to discuss the process of effective curriculum design development, and we will be able to appraise methods used at planning stage uh, in curriculum design through steep analysis and also industry landscape. And I think this uh, second objective is the one that you don't normally uh, get from any other uh, training programs uh, because um, honestly, these two methods that I'm sharing with you um, are methods that I've learned from Singapore. Um, and it has been made compulsory in, in Singapore Higher Education Council for each new program to submit um, STEAM analysis and also industry landscape. And I will explain to you how important they are and, and how we're going to use it in, in marketing our program, especially new program or existing program, and how STEAM analysis will help us to fulfill or to comply and to, uh, to be able to fill in uh, the forms that has been uh, made compulsory by the um, Malaysian Higher Education uh, Department. And finally, um, we hope that at the end of the uh, at at the end of uh, today's workshop, we will be able to apply the OBE concept in our curriculum design and also development. Yeah, so I do hope that we can have a fruitful and also interactive session. So please stop me at any time if you feel that you need further clarification or, or if you feel that uh, some parts of uh, my presentation is, is not really of your interest or not quite relevant, please please say so. Uh, you can just unmute yourself uh, because it because it is quite difficult for me to look at the chat at the moment. And I do hope that um, Secretariat from ADEC, uh, if there's anything in the chat, um, in the chat, can you please uh, also uh, let me know and we will address uh, things in the chat. Right, very quickly, um, because as I mentioned, four hours is, is a little bit too short for us. Um, we normally like to reframe um, ourselves on what curriculum is all about. So very quickly, uh, if any one of you can unmute yourself, because I don't put this in the Padlet, um, I prefer to, to hear your voice actually. Um, can, you, can you just shout if I say uh, curriculum, what first come to your mind? Can anybody? Just unmute yourself. I can write your answer on the board here. Document. Document? Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Learning outcome. Learning outcome, L-O. More? Would you like to unmute yourself and see what comes into your mind? Structure. Structure. Okay, anything else? At least, I'm, I'm going to wait for 10 response at least. <laughs> Anybody like to try? Organized materials. Materials, okay. Rugi tu tak cuba. Because there is the content of the program, yes. If, for example, I I I I uh, rephrase the question, like, um, what do you normally do, uh, when your um department call for curriculum review or curriculum 
design. What will normally you do in that bookshop? What what will you normally discuss? Student performance. Students performance. Okay, I will put somewhere here. Yeah, any more? Don't worry. In education, sorry. Course analysis. Course analysis. Subject. Sorry. Subject and. Keperluan pasaran. Keperluan pasaran. Assessment. Assessment. This is market need, not? Right? Right. Okay. Um, is there any more? If we can stop there. Um, you see now I put most of your um, response on uh, in one column on the left hand side column. And if you notice, I also draw another two columns. And um, the reason why I draw the other two columns is that curriculum is more than those that we list in the first column. If we do a little bit of reflection, you will be able to notice that those listed in the first column are what the lecturer does. The lecturer is the one who actually deal with the document, write the learning outcome, look at the structure of the program, look at the structure of a course, preparing the materials, determining the content, look at students' performance, and then uh, we then look at the course analysis, you know, and look at whether the, any subject needed in a program, and we also look at the market needs and so on and so on. Right, so what do you think the other two columns are, are all about? What do you think? I would my, like to give, sorry. My, my guess is uh, accreditation. Accreditation, good. Nearly there. During accreditation process, right, if we can, for example, use COPA, and that is the reason why I give you COPA 2 in the uh, references, right? If you quickly open up COPA, do you notice that there are seven areas altogether? So curriculum is not just about what the lecturer does. It's also about anything else in COPA 2. If you can quickly, you know, Click on that references and look at the seven areas. Facilities. It involves, yes, it involves facilities. Facilities. Staff. Yep. Staff. Um, Program management. Facilities, staff, student management, and many others, right? But under the facilities, what I would like to emphasize is that Cur curriculum is about the 24-7 experience, learning experience of our students. Okay, So curriculum is not really about what the lecturer does. It's not about the subject content only. It's, it's about how our student, before they enter our program, Okay, going to experience the learning uh, processes before that person will become this person at the end who's going to work in a particular field, right? So, so curriculum is actually a journey, a journey where we convert 
students either from STPM diploma. If I take MQF6, MQF6 is actually degree level, a degree program. So it is actually a journey or learning experiences 24 seven from this point to that point there. If, for example, we are talking about a dentistry program, then we are talking about how can we turn our di diploma or STPM student into a dentist. If it's a medical program, then we are talking about like five to six years. How are we going to turn within that six years a person who have no background on medicine into a qualified medical doctor? Right. And similarly with engineering, how we can, for example, uh, turn a person uh, at the point of entry into an engineer, qualified engineer at the end. So when we want to um, so-called transform uh, all these uh, students into who they're supposed to be, all right, um, subject content, learning outcome structures, they are all um, only part of the curriculum. It's only one third of the curriculum. But what's more important is actually the facilities, the staff, the whole environment, the, the place where they actually live. But we talk about, I would like to emphasize on the facilities, which I'm going to call as learning spaces. Right. So learning spaces is very, very important because, for example, uh, especially programs like medicine and also dentistry, you can forget about turning them into a dentist or turning them into a medical doctor if you don't have a hospital or if you don't have a, a dental hospital and you don't have a dental chair. Right? Similarly with engineering, with even languages or academy pengajian Islam, if you do not have the correct facilities, then forget about you wanting to turn them, turn, uh, transform them into the person that that going to function in their real world of work. So curriculum is not just about providing them with the subject content, with monitoring their performance, with the course analysis and, and with everything that, that the lecturer does, right? So we, we, when it comes to curriculum, we normally forget that learning facilities um, have a lot uh, to play in the development of our graduate attribute. And if you look at the um, whole set of MQ, MQF learning outcome, or if, for example, your program is under professional body, like the medicine is under the MMA, MMC, sorry, and the engineering under the ABED and, and all that, right? If, if you look at the list of the uh, graduate attribute expected uh, from all these professional bodies and also from the MQ, MQF, you will be able to see that not everything is, is cognitive domain, not everything is about the subject content. There are um, quite, quite a huge chunk of the graduate attributes or the learning outcome is actually related to the skills and, and also competency development. And in order for us to develop skills and also competency, we cannot do without um, competent staff and we cannot do without adequate and appropriate facilities. So I would like to emphasis on those two so that we don't forget about curriculum is more than what we normally perceive. So we need to we need to correct that one first before we can proceed, right? So you can see in this illustration uh, that um, I've shown two scenarios. Uh, if this is the person that that's going to be uh, working in 10 years time, right, from now. And the reason why I said 10 years time is because, um, let's say, because some of us are going to offer a new program, I'm going to draw a timeline here. Let's say we start from this year, 20, 23 and let's say that we we have been asked to come up with a new program um, 
and um, I would like to uh, make you aware that the person that we're going to produce at the end of our timeline, okay, which is here, will be in what year? What 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 will be your guess? If we are at the inception stage where we like Red Prozora and also um, team from UM said when you said that you need to to offer new programs, right? Or some of you will have to look back at your current program, right? How long do you take? How long do you think you need to take to to sort of propose a new program? You have any idea? What, two years. Two years. Yeah. Normally, normally, okay. It will take about two years for you to come up with a new program and to get it approved. And once it is approved then uh, you you will need to take a little bit of time to do a little bit of marketing uh, before you can enroll your students. So we are talking about like man, minimum of two years. So 2023, 2025 will be the year when, when you actually offer your new program. Then your student will come in here. And if it's MQF level four, MQF level six, you're talking about four years degree program. And your student will graduate at 2029. Right, 2029. And um, the person that you need to produce is actually the person who has worked in the discipline that you are that your program is actually offering and uh, we are talking about the attribute of an alumni who have worked three to five years if we exaggerate we take five years 2029 20, plus five will be 2034 okay so when we talk about curriculum design we are talking about now we are designing a program but we need to have an idea what's going to happen or oh, we need to have an idea who this person in 2034 going to be working in such environment okay so so it's always about designing something that is forward like 10 years ahead. Okay, so I think this is this is the part where a uh, majority of us, when we design our curriculum, uh, we forget to foresight what's going to happen 10 years from the point when we are uh, trying to come up with a new program. We normally design our program or our subject okay, based on what we have experienced before. 10 years before, five years before. So we can see the problem here. Uh, if we design uh, our curriculum, be it program or subject, based on what is current and based on uh, what we have experienced before, we are not actually preparing our graduate for the time when they're supposed to function. Right, so this is unfair for them because they have to live their life uh, then, right? So this is the part when uh, later I will share with you how are we going to foresight what's going to happen in 10 years time and how what data should we use in order for us to be able to predict um, in what environment our graduate going to uh, be in when they work and that's also the reason why I put this uh, illustration over here uh, because for example in my case 
in UMP, we have to we have been given the mandate by the by Malaysian government to produce uh, as much as possible engineering technologies. University of Malaya, for example, the engineering faculty have the mandate to produce uh, um, research engineers or, or, or pure engineers, but we in UMP have to produce engineering technologies. And when we talk about engineering technologies, for example, I have to be clear if I if I design my subject, if I design my program, I have to be clear um, in 2034 uh, what kind of uh, working environment that my engineering technologies will be in. So this is the picture that I have in mind uh, what my graduates going to uh, work um, with. Uh, you can see that they will be uh, in a position where they use quite a lot of AR, VR, and even nowadays, I think we are all aware that uh, in in our everyday practice, academic practice, we are now also using the AI, like the Shad JPT and so on and so on. So I don't think we can run away from the development of technology um, and and. When it comes to designing curriculum, uh, I don't think we can put aside the technology development and we want to go back to how we teach in the old days or how we teach now. So we need to be ready uh, to teach our uh, student. Um, and if we are currently in intent to um, come up with a new program, we need to find a way how can we now design a program and design a subject such that um, our subject delivery will prepare our credit to work in, a, in, in an environment that they will be um, expected to work in, right? Any question on that at, the, at this point? If there's no question, just to re-emphasize about curriculum and to make sure that we have much understanding of what curriculum is all about. This is the learning spaces, as I mentioned. This is the old learning space, and this is the new learning space that we are talking about. So curriculum is not just all about subject, about examination, but it's also about the learning spaces that um, they need in order to develop their competency, their knowledge, and also the work environment that they are expected to be in. So you can see here, uh, for example, this is, um, and I think nowadays, eh, um, just just to to have a pause there. Nowadays, I think we are all aware that um, the art of networking or collaborative learning, collaborative work is is. Um, much more important nowadays and it is always very very important for us uh, to design a program or to design a subject such that our learners um, are able to work collaboratively um, so to and because of that it is very important to, to nowadays create um, a learning environment even though it is a lecture um, such that they can work collaboratively. You can see here there's um, there's a table uh, provided to them, but uh, this table will allow you to write on them as well so that they can write ideas, discuss your ideas by writing on the table. And I think in Malaysia, you can just convert the existing table uh, quite straightforward. You can just buy all this material from uh, Shopee or from Lazada, you can just transform the existing table into a table where they can write their ideas and everything so that they can uh, work collaboratively. And um, if you are in a position to change any of your uh, classroom, I do hope that you will consider uh, changing it so that um, it has um, you know, a space for your student to work collaboratively um, a technology that will help them to archive uh, their ideas that they have um, collaboratively agreed on and also have the um, facilities uh, like what you see here. 
the gun chart and everything for them to put up their ideas through um, brainstorming methods or any other methods that they want to use before they uh, decided on uh, their final um, collaborative answer. So I do hope that the example of learning space, I know that University of Malaya got a lot of learning spaces um, and uh, Dr. Faizal, Professor Faizal Rafiq is the one who actually uh, mooted the uh, learning spaces project in University of Naya after we had a discussion uh, at, at the uh, Ministry of Higher Education and that is how um, learning spaces is being developed. Uh, however, what I would like to emphasize about learning spaces is that um, we need to consider the design of the learning spaces such that it can support student learning. You can see here, uh, this is actually in Singapore Polytechnic and you can see this is their cafe and even in the cafe student can actually work and you can see all these block ponds are made available to them because nowadays when we talk about uh, learning spaces and we talk about learning, learning should be um, should be made um, easy and also available anywhere, anytime. Um, they shouldn't, we, we, we cannot design uh, a curriculum where we expect students to learn in classroom because I don't think now these students learn in classroom. Um, and um, because of that, uh, we need to consider uh, what are the facilities that students need when they want to learn. And especially nowadays, um, am I correct to say that students most of the time need electricity, internet, and also their gadgets. And not to mention that they need um, some food to keep them going, right? And in here, you can see that this cafe is a place next to student support center so that if there's anything that they would like to chat or anything in, 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 in parts of, in terms of their well-being, their problem. So, so the, the the two you can see that, that the two spaces are not too far apart, right? Uh, what I've noticed uh, in Malaysian higher institution, higher learning institution, is that we tend to design our learning spaces such that um, the cafe is far apart from student support center, is far apart from where they need to uh, discuss their their subject matters and also their, their uh, academic uh, matters uh, under the faculty office. So this is something that we can have a look at and I do hope that um, we can improve how we design our learning spaces so that it is uh, more convenient for our student. And, and I think after COVID-19, we all realized that um, there is a move uh, for us to uh, design learning such that it can take place in a hybrid um, mode. When we talk about hybrid mode, uh, we are talking about we have the physical students in front of us and we also have our distant student in front of us as well. Uh, here, uh, for example, when I talk here, here in uh, Brisbane, QUT Brisbane, um, because majority of uh, their students um, at the Faculty of Engineering are working with company, uh, even from first, first year, uh, they don't um, actually uh, have a hybrid classroom. Um, they, they don't actually run a hybrid classroom. But what they do is they install a system called Echo 360. I'm not sure whether you have heard of this before. Uh, Echo 360. I was attempted to buy this system for UMP during COVID-19, but I don't know how much the system is. But um, I'm lucky to experience Echo 360 here at QUT Brisbane. And you see the, the class uh, of for example, 200 or 300 uh, size in nature um, can be run normally uh, with Echo 360. Why? Because what the system does is that it, it actually um, record the uh, session um, and automatically upload onto the LMS system. 
and uh, the system will also give you quite a lot of uh, analysis and also report on uh, whether student access your uh, lecture recording and, and, and all that. Um, and the reason why QUT have this ECHO 360 also, I think is because, um, as I mentioned, majority of their students are, are working, although they are full-time enrolled student. Therefore, they come to class only twice a week. Uh, and QUT do not have, for example, the uh, policy where attendance have to be 80%. Um, as long as they uh, fulfill the course requirement, they should be okay. So learning can be made flexible to them so they can decide which day they want to come to the campus or which lecture they want to come and the rest of the week they, they actually work with a company. So that is the reason why I was quite surprised when I first I came into the lecture hall and I found like a uh, lecture hall supposed to be with a 300 students only have like um, uh, 30 students or 40 students altogether. And when I asked the lecturer, why is it that um, the attendance is only like, you know, 10% from the actual capacity of uh, the lecture hall? The lecturer said is because a uh, majority of the students are actually working and they only come three days a week. And that is the reason why the lecture is all recorded and students uh, go through the recording uh, when af after they they come back from work. So all these, you can see the, the delivery types uh, of, of the curriculum in your program need to be decided by the data that you're going to uh, get uh, once you do your needs analysis. Kajian pasaran nanti, sekejap lagi kita akan tengok how are we going to use the steep analysis and how steep analysis will inform whether you need this type of classroom or whether you need the traditional type of classroom or whether you need uh, the ECHO 360 install um, in your institution so that you can you can have a working students uh, taking your programs or taking your subject at the same time with the uh, normal face-to-face uh, -face student. So if we to summarize on what curriculum is all about, okay, like what you have um, responded early on, you can see that a curriculum is not all about subjects, it's not all about um, content, which is addressed in uh, COPA uh, area one and also area two. But you can see that um, curriculum is about all those as well. So we are talking about competency of academic staff. We talk. We are talking about the student selection, the support services, um, and we are also talking about resources, including library, lab, the learning spaces that we've always forgotten, students' accommodation. This is where I think Malaysia is far behind when it comes to learning spaces, student accommodation. Malaysia is far behind. The reason why I'm quite confident to say that we are far behind because when I did uh, benchmarking um, uh, research uh, on student mobility uh, in Asia, I visited ASEAN country and we found that uh, even Indonesia, Thailand have much better international student accommodation in comparison to um, uh, Malaysian Highland Institution. Um, and, and also when we talk about curriculum, we are also talking about uh, program management and also program monitoring review and also CQI. They are all there in all the seven areas of our COPA, right? So <clears throat> another thing that I think that uh, we always forgotten when it comes to curriculum, okay, uh, which have a huge implication to our students' 24-7 learning experiences is Anybody like to guess? Is the MQF level. Right. My, my question to you is that how many of us, when we um, design our subject or when we design our program, we make reference to the MQF document? Ada tak yang nak mengaku, otak mengaku? 
Okay. Regardless of uh, where you are in the world, um, you are bound to have to fulfill one of the quality assurance um, system. For example, in the Australia, they have their own system. In Africa, they have their own system. Indonesia and all other countries as well. All right. Um, in Malaysia, we refer to MQF and we can see here that when we want to design our program or when we want to design our subject, we need to be clear. Um, we design our subject or program for which level. Okay, it is, it is important for us to be aware of MQF level. The reason I'm saying this is because Bila bila kena anak sendiri memang sangat terasa lah kan. For example, my my children are, are all in the local um, institution, public university, right? And I and I found that some some lecturers, uh, when they design their subject or when when the program is actually designed, uh, we have forgotten about the MQF level. Sometimes, be, because when we design our program or when we design our subject, we always uh, design based on our own experience. We have forgotten that we need to make sure that um, the design will have to fulfill certain level. The reason I'm saying this is because some degree program level of difficulties and complexities have reached the master's program. Some lecturer who uh, delivering and also designing a diploma program. Okay, design. They design their program and also subject content as if students are at a degree program. Okay, this is this is really really unfair. Um, we can have a lot of discussion on this. Uh, why? Because uh, you see, MQF level is actually to certain extent is a tra tra tradable value okay and i think we all agree and we are all aware that our graduates will get their salary okay they will be paid based on their degree level okay for example diploma at the end of diploma um their grade in jpa will be diploma berapa eh? Kalau degree, it is uh, grade 41 and above. I think diploma is what? 27, grade 27 and above, right? So their salary is um, is not as much as a degree program. I think degree program nowadays, uh, we are talking about like 2,400 ringgit Malaysian. And also at degree level, we are talking about like 1,500 or 1,700 um, after they graduate. So... When we design our program, it is important to look at the MQF level and we should not over design our subject or over design our program because at the end of the day, if we put our student into um, such a high expectation, which is beyond their level, uh, it creates unnecessarily, unnecessarily stress and also tension uh, in our student. And, and we also need to make sure that we do understand what is the <clears throat> what is the intention of diploma program, for example, and what is the intention of a degree program and a master's program and also PhD program. Diploma program, I think for, for your information, uh, if, if in engineering or I think in, I'm not sure in dentistry in engineering we are talking about producing technicians okay technicians they are not engineers they are just technician if we are designing a program for degree for degree level then we expect to produce an engineer okay the job scope of a technician and so the job scope of an engineer are different okay so for example i'm i am teaching in UMP, I face uh, a huge challenge where I, I was asked to teach soil mechanics subject at two different levels. One is at diploma level and another one is at degree level. 
And you can see that the subject content is still the same, but how do I design my curriculum at a diploma level? And how am I going to design my subject <clears throat> in a degree level? Okay, this is when I need to refer back to MQF. And also, this is also the time when I really need to, to go back and ask myself for diploma, who am I going to produce? What kind of work are they going to involved in? And for degree program, I also need to have a clear picture of uh, who am I going to produce and what kind of work they, they need to perform when, when they really at the, you know, world, world of work. So that, those two data helps me to see the difference in how I deliver my subject, although the content of the subject is 100% similar. Okay, for diploma level, because uh, I know that they're going to be um, a technician, Therefore, when I teach my subject content, I focus more on the skill development. So I focus more on how they should perform all those um, lab tests. I, I focus more on how they should um, handle machineries um, when they work uh, at, in, a, in a, a contracting firm uh, in the field, uh, whereas when I teach the same topic or the same content at degree level, I did not actually stress anything uh, much on uh, lab tests and also on how they should perform the actual work uh, at the field, but I stress more on the principles, on the theory, so, they can, so that they can deal with the design uh, related to that particular content. So you can see that we need to be aware of the MQF level. And by right, before we begin with any new program, when we want to design any new program or subject, MQF is the first document that we need to refer to. And we need to read all those descriptor under the five clusters as what is shown in this diagram. Is it okay? Ada soalan tak dekat situ? Ataupun tak berapa perasan tentang MQF ni? Okay. I think only after we have referred to MQF, we then have to refer to COPA so that we can find out how in detail we can design a program, how we can design a subject, how we can take care of the other, you know, five areas that we're supposed to take care of so that we can uh, get approval from the MQA um, and it's ready, and then only it's ready for us to submit to the um, Malaysian um, Department of Higher Education. Okay. If there is no question, okay, this is just a quick um, illustration on how we uh, level up with other countries when it comes to, um, you know, parents or students being given a choice where you want to uh, study in higher education. This um, data was uh, last year um, and it is actually from Singapore. They run a survey and it was found that a majority of parents or students when it comes to wanting to pursue their higher degree, they would like to go to United Kingdom, United States and also the UAE. Uh, ASEAN country is still not doing very well. We are only like 5.8%. And um, honestly, um, I, if you ask me, uh, since currently I'm at Brisbane, I must say that um, in terms of uh, staff, uh, especially academic staff, we have um, good talent, good enough talent. Um, in comparison to uh, those countries that majority preferred. However, as I mentioned again and again, we lost in terms of student support and also in terms of facilities, especially in terms of learning spaces. And I think uh, 
our children and students nowadays, they are very choosy about uh, learning spaces. They do not want, I think learning spaces make a lot of difference in how effective we learn, effective, how effective uh, we work as well. Uh, because if you have a good system, all supported by technology and also us, all supported by ICT, you can get your work done uh, effortlessly. Uh, whereas I think if, if your learning spaces is not well supported, um, everything you need to perform, you have to do it in a hard way, right? So I think uh, the ASEAN member country uh, may start to look at um, how we can improve our learning spaces when it comes to curriculum design and also development. Uh, because as far as document is concerned. When I talk about document, we're talking about the OBE document, we're talking about the policy and all that. We are doing well. We don't have to worry about that because um, last five years when the British Council uh, did a did did a study. Um, Malaysia I think was ranked um, number I think number five is it number three, number five, or number seven in the whole world on how good our policy is. But I think the, the main problem that we need to address here is actually the implementation and also our learning spaces. So let's uh, work together. And I do hope that those who are here with me today um, get the message loud and clear that uh, we have no problem with our academic competencies and also our academic talent. Uh, we only need to work on our learning spaces and also um, on the facilities and how we support our student, right? So this is a, a small activity that I prepare for you. Um, and you can see that there are several words here that I would like you to try and um, put them in a list. Would you like to try? So we have if I can just end the show first so that I can move the words. Anybody like to try and put them in hierarchy? I will shift these words according to your suggestion. We have OBE curriculum, program approval, guideline for good practices, program standard, COPA, constructive alignment, and also accreditation. Anyone? Anybody? <laughs> UM staff ni sangat humble kan? <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> where, do, where, do you, where do you think accreditation will be? Is it after MQF? Is it before MQF? Where do you think program standard will be? Accreditation will be the last one. Accreditation will be the last one. Okay, I'll put it down, put it down. Okay, good try. And then? Uh, uh, program approval for that. Program approval be above accreditation, is it? Yeah. All right, okay. Then? MQF first. MQF will be the top, right? Um, probably guideline for good practices. Mm -hmm. Where will it be? Mm, probably OBE is the first one, isn't it? Uh, MQF, uh, MQF first, OBE. Okay, MQF first, OBE, right. No, program standard got to come first so, so. Uh, after MQF. <laughs> after MQF, so this one will go down, will go down, and this one will go up. Oops, never mind. Okay. 
Anybody else like to? How, how, what about COPA? COPA will be after MQF. COPA will be after MQF, okay. Then we have the GGP, guideline for good practices in short GGP. That one I'm not sure, but constructive alignment will be after OBE. Constructive alignment will be after OBE. Okay. We are almost there. Where do we put this? Hmm. Probably the first one. First one. There. So will will this be like in order for us to design a curriculum, we need to actually have a look at the GGP and also program standard, having to fulfill the MQF, COPA, OBE curriculum, then constructive alignment, program approval, then accreditation. Is that the story? Rafi? Um, my guess. The flow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good try, uh, but this is where I'm going to help you. Um, I'm going to show you how actually a new program get approved and how all academic programs in Malaysia get approved and, and currently being being offered uh, to to all students. Right, you can see here, this is actually the official flowchart um, for a new program to be offered. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether there will be, a, now there will be a different flowchart for the uh, private sector, but uh, the, there's, there will only be a small change between the private sector and also the public sector. So Prozora will highlight to you which where the difference are, right? You can see here that, um, for example, you said and also uh, like Prozora, when you have uh, the intention to offer a new program, first of all, your um, your institution, okay, or or your section will have to sort of uh, come up with the um, idea uh, and come up with a draft um, structure of the new program. Um, then you need to actually fill in the um, what we call the kertas cadangan or the proposal paper, okay, uh, and uh, that need to be. Um, actually presented at the Mushwarat Saringan Awal. This is the initial screening um, meeting, okay? In this initial screening meeting, okay, the uh, program owner, okay, will have to present your um, new program uh, at the inception time. You don't need to design your curriculum for this new program at this stage. Why? Because the uh, committee, uh, the screening, uh, in the initial screening committee um, will actually give you a green light or a red light. If it's a red light, meaning that uh, your proposal is not approved, therefore you cannot um, move on and develop that program further for final approval. Final approval is actually over here, right? So if, for example, your, uh, it, your, your, your new program uh, at inception being approved by JPT, by the Department of uh, Malaysian Higher Education, then only you can proceed to uh, develop that program in full. And that is when you need to submit to MQA uh, for MQA01 for MQA to check whether the program that you have developed have fulfilled all the program standard requirement and have fulfilled the MQF and also the COPA2 requirement. So after you have passed all those requirements from MQA, you will be given the, provis the provisional accreditation status or in short, we call it PASS. Bukan Parti 
politik eh. <laughs> um, you will get the provisional accreditation uh, status and after you get the provisional accreditation status you get the approval from the senate uh, of your high learning institution then only together with that approval from your institution and also approval from the MQA, you submit your final, uh, what we call uh, document to the Ministry of Higher Education for final approval. So during that final approval, there won't be any more so-called viva or for you to defend your, your application anymore. Uh, if everything in, is in order, basically your application will be approved. So once it's been approved, then the uh, office at the uh, JPT or um, Department of Higher Education will send um, the document to the minister's office. Then the minister will actually sign the approval letter and that approval letter is what we call the program approval letter for you now able to market and offer your program right so the difference for the uh, public university is that you do not need i'm not sure now but you need to check during my time at uh, mohi um, this process is not required okay for the private university, meaning that for private university, there won't be any um, initial screening um, done by the Ministry of Higher Education. Um, the reason being um, private university okay, pr or private higher learning institution said that it is my money, sure, therefore why is it that the ministry would like to have a say on whether or not I can actually offer uh, this particular program? Okay, so that process has been taken out from this flowchart. Right? The reason for the initial screening, later on I will uh, explain further about the initial screening. Um, أول واحد بروفيسور دكتور باسم عبد الحسن مياحي عطيه ورا ابني اسمه نور من منو على البوز دكتورين ويا صور ما أكو دولة مال كلية الستاف حاطين اسم أمو وداني ضام روحي أمو is it is it okay to yes I already unmute okay thank you right um I will explain to you what what's going to happen in the um MSA ataupun mesyuarat saringan awal they call it, okay, um, or the initial screening. During that initial screening, the role of GPT is to make sure that your the new program that you have in mind will be able to sustain and will uh, and they will actually check for you whether or not that your suggestion um, will um, will allow that program to be sustainable, relevant, and also needed by the country or needed by the uh, intended, um, you know, uh, kumpulan sasaran or, or target participants that you want to market that program for, right? So, in relation to this whole flow chart, go, let, let's go back to the whole process over here, right? You can see that uh, if I can help you to rearrange this, program approval is the last, it's the final that we aim for. And in order for us to get our program approved, okay, we need to make sure that our our program fulfill the Malaysian, sorry, fulfill the MQF requirement, the MQF because we need to send MQA01 to MQA, okay? And this whole process may take one year, one and a half years. And that is why from the point of inception to being able to offer a program, normally it takes like two years altogether because in order for you to submit to, for, for public university, right? For you to submit to JPT, uh, for MSA and then for you to submit to MQF, that in itself will take you about two years or maybe more than two years. So 
in order for in order for us to design a program that fulfill the MQF requirement, we need to make sure that we design it according to COPA. Okay. And if we design and fulfill COPA, we actually able to make sure that our program and our subject fulfill the outcome-based education curriculum. And outcome-based education is not outcome-based if we do not take care of constructive alignment. Constructive alignment, right? So where is program standard and also uh, guideline for good practices uh, be placed? You can see that apart from um, COPA and also um, OBE curriculum process that we need to refer to, we also need to refer to program standard. For your information, program standard is written based on COPA, except that it has been um, written with the context of a certain discipline. Guideline for good practices is written also based on COPA and also program standard and also based on uh, educate some known educational principles and also best practices in some of the high learning institution. Uh, I just like to, um, okay, before we end uh, on this slide, where is accreditation? Accreditation will be placed somewhere up here, okay? Why do I say so? Because after the program has been approved, if I can just rearrange this a little bit, take this down. At the point of approval, all right, remember from the other slide, I mentioned that at the point of approval, the program has received pass provisional accreditation along the way. When you submit to MQA, MQA01, you will get pass and your program will be approved by the Ministry of Higher Education based on the provisional accreditation. And after you get the program approval, you then offer the program to the public, right? And then you run your program, you implement, you run your program. And when running your program, you need to be aware of, you need to apply for full accreditation status, okay, the FA, at least one year before the program end. If you are talking about the MQF 6 degree program, at the end of third year, you need to prepare your document for full accreditation status application to MQA. The common, um, I would say that the, the common misconception uh, about PASS eh, is that once you receive pass, that does not mean that everything is okay. Everything about what you have designed and what you are um, implementing, what you have designed is correct. Okay, I have come across quite a number of private university and also public university got into trouble when the um, curriculum design where they received the provisional accreditation status was in actual not really that fit for them to run. And they said that if I have already received provisional accreditation, should, shouldn't that mean that my curriculum is, is good enough for me to run? And why is it that during my final accreditation application, I realized that I have a lot of problems such that it, it's almost impossible for me to get accreditation. I came across uh, pub, private universities that did not get full accreditation. And uh, as a result, uh, their student, 
that has graduated from that program cannot actually work in that particular field because uh, their program uh, failed to uh, get uh, accreditation from the MQA. So all I'm saying is that when MQA check for your MQA01, they check against MQF and also COPA, but they know that uh, if your program has fulfilled COPA and also uh, MQF, that does not mean that everything is perfect for you to implement. You need to remember that um, if I can refer back to the timeline, 2023, 2025, 20, 20, can anybody help me? For 2029, 2034, right? This is when you submit to MQA for your pass. Your pass is somewhere here. Let's say your pass is at 20, um, 24. You can see that once you got your approval, program approval, and once you want to implement your program, you have reached the time when there's a lot of development going on in technology, in the content of the subject, in, in a lot of things. So things might change along the way. So that is the reason why we need to be very careful about holding on to our document that we submitted when we apply for approval and implement those exactly like what it says in the document because we need to make sure that during the implementation, we need to um, analyze and also need to make certain changes and also review when, whenever needed. Okay, And that is also the reason that some of the uh, program design their curriculum such that it is fluid, they call it fluid, organic, this and that, so that they will be able to cater for all the changes throughout the duration of the program implementation. So four years is a long time. You can see that you design the program and you apply for provisional accreditation in 2023. And by 2025, uh, for example, if we are talking about um, programs from, uh, you know, from faculty of uh, computer or computer science, I mean, the by 2025, whatever that you design in 2023 might have been obsolete already, right? So, we just need to be careful about uh, all this um, curriculum design uh, that we have submitted and, and got uh, provisional accreditation at the beginning uh, because uh, we are talking about the curriculum also need to take into account the dynamics of um, the technology and also the subject content as it as as it as we move along. Right. Is there any question on the um, the whole process of getting a program approved and offered in higher learning institution in Malaysia? Ada uh, soalan enggak? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, assuming uh, the institution got this uh, provisional accreditation, mm -hmm. um, and then before we get the full accreditation, are we allowed to make changes to the the document that we submitted earlier? That mean the one that we got a uh, provisional accreditation. Are we allowed to change our document? We are allowed. Why? Because the requirement for curriculum review. Ah, uh, tadi team UM said need to do curriculum review. Check. Can so ah ne? What is the frequency for curriculum review? It's five years. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, curriculum, that, that is the common answer that people give when it comes mm. to curriculum review. When we ask them, what is the frequency for curriculum review? Everybody will say five years. Okay, if you read carefully the document from the Ministry of Higher Education, we said that the curriculum review need to be conducted minimum, minimum once in a five years. Yeah. 
That is so the minimum. Is, yes. Mm. Kan, satu, one whole cycle of a degree program is four years, right? Yeah. We said that, okay, review your curriculum at least once every five years. Mm. But by right, if you read carefully, curriculum need to be reviewed when there is a huge need for it to be reviewed. Mm. I mean, we can't hold on to doing something that is not relevant anymore or there is not right anymore. For example, mm. um, one of the institution eh, uh, yang saya bantu lah pergi, pergi bantu on curriculum development, they are still, for example, offering something that has been absent obsolete and also they are still offering things like um, kaedah mengambil nota sebagai dia MPU courses okay but nowadays you can see that there's so much that te technology can offer perlu ke student ambil nota sebenarnya ataupun perlu uh, is there's a need for them to keep those um, obsolete or irrelevant subject content uh, anymore so when um, there's something change, um, especially for for example, eh, um, programs like um, economy, finance, marketing, with all these different kind of uh, with all this technology, Bitcoin, what whatsoever, you know, with the gig technology and all that, you you can't stay the way uh, the way it was when you were applying the mm. approval for the program. You see, so when there's a big shift especially during pandemic COVID-19 and after COVID-19 right after the pandemic by right during the pandemic we already see that there is a huge uh, thing that we need to change in our curriculum de delivery in our curriculum content and in terms of a lot of things right therefore we can't afford actually to wait for that particular year then only we do the review mm. if for example the pandemic is here then perhaps we need to review it over here we have reason for us to actually review and that is also the reason why is it that at ministry we always puzzle why is it that a uh, high learning institution only review their program up once in five years why why they why is it that they don't respond um you know fast enough to changes that they have already experienced so these are the thing that I think we need to uh, be aware of and we and and if we are in a position where we are in control. Mm. I'm I'm saying this because at at the moment at UMP I'm not in control because I'm not uh, holding any position. So uh, what, whatever that I say macam tak laku lah kan padahal benda tu perlu. There are things that we need to review and we need to change at that point of time. We, we simply can't wait because we know that it is wrong. Mm. And and I, the reason why I say this because I have seen um, many um, uh, that fail full accreditation uh, status application simply because they fail to notice that they need to respond to changes. Mm. Right? They did not do anything about their original curriculum that they designed at the point when they apply for approval at MQA01. So that's my response to it. Yeah, thank you. Because I, we, I think most of us were made to believe that we can't do anything, you know, to whatever document that we have submitted, um, you know, until the, the next round, whether it's curriculum review or uh, for the next curriculum review, then only we can make changes. Yeah, so that, that, be wrong yeah. that that is why I think it is important for both, eh? for both practitioner and also for those who actually hold the position to mm. have the correct understanding of all these processes. And mm. in order for you to be able to be sure and to be um, confident on whether or not you can change this or not, uh, you may refer to the book that I've given to you. Um, ada kan tadi kan? Buku JPT tu. This one. Right? In this book, if you refer to a particular chapter, there will be a list of what changes can you make and whether the changes is defined as minor or major and who you need to submit to. Do you need to submit to MQA? Do you submit? 
need to submit to JPT or do you need to submit to, for example, um, to to your curriculum committee at in your university, right? And even curriculum committee at university, there are various levels, right? Curriculum committee at the university level, which the highest is the Senate or the Board of Study, and then you have curriculum committee at the faculty level, and then you have the curriculum committee at the uh, department level, and also curriculum committee at the discipline level. So this is what we call the uh, curriculum committee and their autonomy. And I think this needs to be clear, and the levels of uh, curriculum committee and their roles and um, what we call their roles and function okay, need to be clearly st stated so that you can you can be sure of um, the approval change in curriculum uh, requires approval at what level, mm. right? Um, so that you see here, this part onward, you can see there, okay, perubahan, category perubahan maklumat, okay. If, for example, you like to change even a single word in the name of the program, then it has to get approval at the ministry level, not at the faculty level, not at the university level, not at the MQA level. It has to be at the ministry level. Why? Because the name has an implication to the uh, award of the scholarship. Mm. Okay, and that's the whole reason why is it that any change in the name of the program uh, uh, whether it, it has just been approved or whether it is currently running, it need to go through um, the approval again, need to be uh, re-approved, um, need to be submitted to, to JBT or to Malaysian Higher Education Department because um, our, our MOHI will have to not notify the various agencies like the JBT, they have to they have to inform JPA for Tangga Gaji and Nama program. They will have to inform uh, PTPTN. They will have to inform um, many, many other agencies uh, who are the stakeholders to the program. Okay, and you can see there are further lists down there that categorize uh, the uh, changes in a form of minor, where it can only go through up to your. Um, higher learning institution level. And as for University of Malaya, because University of Malaya is a SWA status university, meaning that you have your own MQA inside the university that can give you approval. Therefore, you can see that even at the um, even at the whole flowchart over here, University of Malaya do, do not need to submit to MQA any changes or any new program that you would like to get approval from the Ministry of Higher Education uh, will need to be submitted to... Siapa ya? Prof. Rosita sekarang kan yang jaga ASCE ya? Eh? Is it? The University of Malaya, the, the Center for Academic Excellence, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And you also need to submit to um, QMAC. So QMAC and also the ASCE in University of Malaya will act as MQA and will act as JKPT and will screen a new program at University of Malaya before the new program um, will be uh, sent to uh, JPT for final approval. So that's the whole process. Okay, so I think we have uh, talked about the timeline and you can see here that these are the governing bodies uh, at your, uh, when you want to design your program or your subject, you can see that uh, whenever that you design your program or your subject, you need to make sure that uh, you know what is the requirement uh, from the Ministry of Higher Education, from MQA, and also perhaps some internal requirement from your university. In this case, is your QMAC and also the ESP. And also if you are um, under any uh, accreditation body, you will have to know what is the requirement from your accreditation body as well. Right, so it is not easy to fulfill everybody's uh, requirement, but then again, uh, it is 
whether we like it or not, as an academic, we need to make sure that we are aware that our subject and our program are actually governed by some of uh, some of these bodies, uh, governing bodies requirement. Okay, so these are the four stages of uh, curriculum design and delivery process, and um, we have to um, actually go through. If we do review, obviously, if we do if we do curriculum review, all that we need to do is we need to start from here. We need to collect data and analyze our data and based on our data, we use that data to inform how are we going to plan our revised curriculum or how are we going to come up with a new curriculum because the old program, for example, the, or the old curriculum is no longer fit for us to, to offer, right? And only after that, we will go through the planning, development, implement, and also evaluation stage. Okay. So this is what the GGP says. Um, I was a member of uh, the GGP, uh, and there's a recommendation on what you need to do at the planning stage, development stage, implementation, and also evaluation. Uh, by the way, Umu, if we need to take a break, just, just let me know. Yeah. Or if any one of you feel that we need a five minute breaks or anything like that, just just let me know. Because it's online, I suppose um, you can have your cup of tea or coffee or, or anything for you to munch um, while while we are going through it. Is it is it okay? Is is everybody okay that way? Five minutes break for toilet break. Uh, okay, okay. Do we like to take a break now? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, we take five minutes break and we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you. Umu, Umu, are you here? Okay, I'll put it in a chat. Umu, kita start balik uh, five minutes to eleven. Is it okay, everybody? Okay, boleh tak Tasha? Boleh ya, saya nak soalan dulu. Tasha, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, kat sini tadi dia black out. <laughs> oh iya ke? It's okay. Sebab, sebab nanti by the time habis saja workshop ni saya dah asal kat sini. Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. Alright, okay. thank you. Alright.
Is it okay for us to <coughs> continue? Is everybody yes. back? Okay. Thank you. Yes, All right. So I will share my screen again. And I hope everybody have got a chance to grab something. So <clears throat> you can see my screen, right? <coughs> okay, just now we have looked at the four stages of curriculum design and delivery processes. But in this particular workshop, we will focus a little bit more on the planning stage and also on the development stage. Um, <clears throat> and for those who will do curriculum review, uh, you will you can actually request from ADEC or you can actually go to the MQA um, training on the um, curriculum review and they will talk a lot on the how you actually do the evaluation process. Right, so let's uh, let's have a look at the planning stage and it says that um, it is recommended for us to convene a Curriculum committee assess needs and issues, identify key issues such as the MQF and also the institutional vision and mission, and also identify trends in the field of study or profession. I think I have actually discussed with you um, earlier on on the significance of having curriculum committee, and I'm sure that you um, you are aware that the curriculum committee. Um, have several level uh, and the the highest level at your institution is the senate or at university level the highest is actually the senate and at the national level the highest curriculum committee is the this jawatan kuasa jkpt and jkpt is the national curriculum committee that will approve all academic programs in malaysia right so <clears throat> Is having curriculum committee an option or is it a must? To be honest with you, curriculum committee is a must because it is set in COPA. So it is a requirement of COPA. If, for example, you are in a private university, you need to have a curriculum committee. Uh, it doesn't have to be similar like what you have in University of Malaya. You have all the levels at the program level, at the faculty, university level. But some smaller public institution, they only have one curriculum committee that actually does everything at the various level. And the reason for having curriculum committee, if I have not thrown out, I actually thrown out that, that particular slide, is because if you want to make any changes to your curriculum, uh, you need to know whether or not um, you need to submit to uh, faculty or to your department level only, curriculum committee department level only, or you need to submit to to the highest level that is GBT. Um, I think in engineering uh, faculty, they have a table where they actually show if you make uh, any changes. Um, I think maybe I can share with you uh, that particular table, if you give me a minute. If I can just uh, take the previous slide. That I used last year. I have actually take away that particular slide for this year. But I think uh, one of you have actually asked that question. It was well for us to go through that slide again. Okay, this is the slide that I would like to share with you. This is an example of showing the autonomy of um, various levels of curriculum committee. This is an attempt to clarify what can be changed in, in a subject and who can uh, propose for a change and who can approve for any changes made. You can see here that in engineering faculty, if, you, if, we, if we like to change, for example, the um, assessment methods, okay, in the subject that we are taking over, for example, we are allowed to make changes as long as it is aligned to the learning outcome. 
and because it is in orange in color, so the orange represent that the changes can be proposed by the lecturer, but it need to be approved by the faculty, right? So because it is in a green box, so the uh, approval need to be done, need to be given by the faculty. That is how you read this particular um, uh, table in terms of autonomy. So you can see that, that assessment method, teaching and learning strategies, um, and all those uh, can be changed um, during the implementation of a program or, or a course, right? As long as it get approval at the faculty level. You can see that, uh, for example, the um, one in uh, written in red and they are in a pink box, uh, those changes are more um, serious. Therefore, um, if, for example, the lecturer feel that the learning outcome is not appropriate for that particular subject, the lecturer can propose changes of the learning outcome for that subject to the program coordinator and only program coordinator can actually uh, take the changes uh, forward to the faculty. Then the faculty will need to get an approval up to the Senate level. So this is how, uh, for example, Faculty of Engineering has made it clear to everybody that what uh, lecturer can change, what they cannot change by themselves, and what are the uh, levels that um, the curriculum committee need to take uh, the changes for approval. Okay. Ada soalan tak dekat situ? Let's go back to uh, our slide. Uh, and in order for us uh, to design our curriculum, right, uh, for all these, these three stages, we cannot afford not to understand or to use the OBE system. And, <clears throat> and in actual, um, maybe some of us, especially if we are holding a position, people can actually challenge and ask you who who said that we need to design our program or our subject using the OBE system. Although it is now common that we are designing our subject and program using the OBE system. The OBE has been mentioned in our national policy, the first national poli policy, PSPTN, uh, in, um, in 19... 19 uh, if, if you check on PSPTN, there will be a mention of outcome-based education there, and that's where OBE started, right? So this is the bigger picture of what uh, OBE is all about. You can see that in order for us to design a program, it has to be top-down. So when we talk about top-down, if you notice that all the arrows are actually going down, so meaning that the process start from here, 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 two, three, four, five. Okay. And going through the five steps, okay, from top to bottom, we cannot design our program from five, then three, then two, then one. We, we cannot do that. Strictly speaking, OBE need to be designed top down and none of these steps uh, can be um, skipped. And if we are in a position to control uh, how we design a program or design a subject, we need to make sure that all these steps are consecutive. They shouldn't be concurrent, right? So when I talk about consecutive, meaning that you need to, for example, you need to begin with a clear institutional mission vision and you need to have stakeholders needs analysis. Right. Some of you at the beginning said that curriculum is actually about uh, kajian pasaran tadi atau pendapatan pasaran. You are right. So by right, we need to identify whether a program is actually needed or not based on the needs analysis. Right. And also uh, the program need to be designed, uh, taking into consideration the institution mission and vision. Then only you will have to state your PEO. Then after you have your PEO, then only you are ready to, to write statements of your PLO 
or PO, then majority of us um, normally skip step number four, which I'm going to explain uh, later what step number four is all about, then only uh, you can actually ask individual lecturer to go away and start to design your course and submit your course learning outcome. All right. So this is just a bit of detail of what the OBE process is all about. So we're going to focus on these two. All right. And this is the um, outcome-based education system uh, in short, uh, where outcome-based education is about, you know, setting or having a clear goals or objective outcome. Some people call it goals, objective outcome. If it's at the program level, we call it goal or we call it aims. If at the uh, program, at the PLO level, we call it Pro, uh, at the program level, okay, we normally call it goals, aim, objective. However, at the subject level, we always call it outcome. There is a slight difference between objective and outcome, right? And once we have a clear goal, objective, or aims, then we move on to setting how are we going to know whether our goal, aim, objective, or outcome is achieved. Right. Therefore, we need to actually conduct an assessment. Okay. We need to choose appropriate assessment that has the ability to measure the outcome. Then only after we have chosen the uh, appropriate assessment that has the ability to measure the outcome, then only we choose appropriate instruction that will um, prepare our students for the assessment that we choose to measure the learning outcome. So that is roughly uh, the definition of constructive alignment. So earlier on, I mentioned that we cannot claim that we practice OBE if we do not take care of constructive alignment. So constructive alignment is the heart of outcome-based education. And what constructive alignment is all about is about one, two, three in this diagram. Is about state, good, clear learning outcome, and choose appropriate assessment method that can measure the learning outcome, and finally choose appropriate instructions that prepare our student for the assessment method chosen to measure the learning outcome. If you listen to that narrative, you will be able to see that number three follow number two, number two follow number one, and that's what outcome-based uh, uh, system uh, is all about and that's what constructive alignment has been defined. So if we do not practice constructive alignment, we cannot claim that our subject or our program is outcome-based. Uh, if our program is not outcome-based, then we cannot say that we comply to MQF or COPA. If we do not comply to MQF or COPA, we should not get accreditation and our program should not be approved right so that is how serious uh, constructive alignment is is all about and understanding what is required behind uh, this particular uh, diagram so let's have a look at our planning stage and um, i have uh, mentioned about the need for curriculum committee and the job of curriculum committee is not during curriculum design and also not only uh, at the point where we need to review the curriculum, but the job of curriculum committee is actually throughout the process of the curriculum plan, develop, implement, and also evaluate. So curriculum committee uh, actually has a 24 seven job to look after the quality of the curriculum. Okay, at the planning stage, okay, the curriculum committee must plan how to get your colleagues to see whether the subject, the content of the subject or the program, if we are talking about the program level, whether the program is needed. Just now, you am said you mentioned that you would like to come up with a new program and I think Prof Zora also mentioned about new program and I think uh, some of you um, in uh, this workshop will come across where your faculty will have to offer a new program or will have to change the existing program because it's, it's no longer perhaps relevant uh, with the current situation right so when you would like to determine whether the program is 
still relevant, uh, is going to be needed or not, you need to actually uh, look at the future, okay? Because we have drawn the timeline, okay? We need to find out whether in 20, uh, just a 2034, right? Whether in 2034, the talent that you're going to produce from the program that you're going to offer or the program that you are currently running is still required. Okay, it's still required either in Malaysia or in country that where you would like uh, to, to, to get your students. Okay, how are we going to determine whether the program is still relevant or whether a new program uh, will be needed? This is when we need to foresight, uh, to do a little bit of foresighting. And, um, and, and normally, uh, when you do foresighting, uh, you will need to use a tool for you to do foresighting and the tools that I would like to share with you today is called steep analysis, right? Um, the, the reason why I like to share steep analysis is because the data that you will need to find uh, in order for you to conduct the steep, the steep analysis will enable you to uh, fill in the uh, the the kertas cadangan or the proposal uh, paper that you need to submit to the Ministry of Higher Education in order for you to apply for new program or changes for a new program, right? And when you uh, submit to the Ministry of Higher Education, saying that I would like to offer a new program, right? You need to um, come for a different. A, a defense session or a viva, uh, where during that viva, the National Curriculum Committee will ask you all these questions. They will ask you if you offer this program, the program that you would like to apply, if you offer this program, who is going to be your, um, who is going to be your feeder, uh, who is going to be the, uh, do, have you identified the market, which company is going to take your graduate, Okay. Name the company that will take your graduate uh, and normally they do not want just the name of the company, they want you to identify the industry that will take your graduate. Okay, When we talk about marketability, normally JPT or MOHI will ask you where your graduate is going to work, in what discipline. If they cannot get a job in that particular discipline, where what is the next discipline that they can uh, go into? Right, and normally they will also ask which company will uh, they be in. They will also ask questions like, um, okay, can you name the um, the the name or can you name the actual post that your graduate will uh, resume after they graduate? What is the JPA tangga gaji ataupun grade? As I mentioned, either J37 or, for example, D, DG or DS52. So you need to know what is the name or the post that your graduate will resume. Okay, And they will also, the National Curriculum Committee will also ask you a question like, if you like to offer this program, where are you going to get your students? How many students do you project each year? Okay. For example, you design a program where you expect that you were going to get 30 students every uh, semester or every session. Then you need to know where you're going to get them from. Are you going to get them from your own Asasi program? Are you going to get them from a specific um, uh, um, pre-university institution that has an MOE or MOU with you? Uh, which which state uh, of students will, will you get them from? And you have to make sure that you can prove to them, not only you just said that, oh, we have so-and-so feeder, uh, uh, institution to be our feeder. You need to prove using data, okay, uh, you valid data. Normally, uh, this data coming from Department of Statistics Malaysia, DOSM, Okay, to prove that we have enough 
feeder to come into university. And I think you're all aware nowadays, okay, that uh, Malaysia and also ASEAN country is facing um, reduction in the um, birth, uh, what we call, <clears throat> is it birth rate, you call it? Right? Um, where people, where we are now going down in terms of having younger generation and Singapore is even worse, they even have a special program to make sure that young couples will get children uh, to be Singaporean. So Malaysia is not an exception. So feeder, feeder is a big problem nowadays. Uh, so if you feel that if you want to offer a new program and you have difficulties in getting local student after you have done your STEAM analysis, then you need to find out how am I going to offer my new program and where am I going to get my feeder? Am I going to still um, keep my target where my feeder uh, Malaysian student, SPM or STPM levels, or am I going to open up my program where my um, feeder is going to come from, for example, uh, Africa, okay, uh, from, from, I don't know, from Indonesia, um, or from, from Bangladesh, you need to find that that is why looking at data from World World Bank is, is very important because you from from that data, from that demographic data, it will tell you where young people are and how much they can be your potential feeder for your new program, right? Okay. And also, for your information, at the Ministry of Higher Education, they will ask you, if you want to offer a new program, they will ask you questions such as, how many uh, public university and also private university uh, have offered similar program like what you are uh, trying to propose? Right. So you need to already done this uh, homework where you check how many um, private or, or public institution offer almost similar program to, to what you, you're trying to, to apply for. Um, for your information, at JPT, they have a division, okay, called Bahagian Kemasukan, Pelajar, okay, I think now they call it differently, but the, the job is during this meeting, they already have all the data showing similar program like what you apply for. And they have all the data about how many students enroll in such program, how many students apply. So how many students apply may not be similar to how many students enroll because some programs are popular, but at, in the end, there are not many students enroll. If, for example, the program that you are applying are popular, is popular but not many enrolled, uh, then very likely that JPT, if you are public university, that Ministry of Higher Education will, will not uh, give you a green light uh, because it's not going to be sustainable. For private university, for your information, because you do not have uh, this uh, so-called screening um, process, uh, I hope that the private university will form a committee that and and will act uh, as um, you know uh, Mohi screening committee so that you will uh, address all these uh, points that you need to consider before you can be sure that you need to offer that particular program or not. Right, so you can see that there are uh, quite a number of things that you need to uh, think about at the planning stage, even at the point when you feel that you would like to offer this particular program, you need to check uh, your intention against some of these points to be sure that it will be sustainable, to be sure that it will be relevant and to be sure that it is the talent that is required by the country or by your stakeholders, right? Uh, another um, source of data that I think you would like to um, use is the PT, PTN or the loan um, agency um, because, and also JPA, Mara, things like that because um, they will give you 
like a picture on whether or not um, the uh, the graduates from a particular program, if let's say you would like to uh, apply uh, to offer for a new program that is similar to some of the existing program, they will see whether um, students have been able to pay back their loan because if the um, employability of that particular field uh, is low, that, in the, that will also be a candidate where if you apply new program in that particular discipline, it will be turned down, right? So that will be a clue for you to use in order at, at the planning stage. So let's go through the STEEP analysis. And uh, the STEEP analysis, S-T-E-E-P, stands for Social Demographic, Technology, Economy, Environment and Nature, Political Legal, right? So I think you have uh, listened to my narration earlier on about how we use social demographic data. So where do we get this social demographic data? In Malaysia, we can actually use uh, two uh, main sources. One is from uh, Department of Statistics, DOSA. And you can also check on ILMIA. Okay. And um, after you have looked at Department of Statistics data, um, to make sure that um, we have enough young um, and also feeder to get into our program. Remember the timeline, 2023. So we need to get students, students normally masuk degree pada umur 20 tahun kan? Betul tak? Betul, betul. Betul, betul. Betul, eh? Uh, 20 years old kan, 20 years old, in, if, if, if it's in Malaysia, it's 20 years old. So you need to check from the uh, dosem and also ilma, do we have enough, for example, if you're targeting, if, if your program will be in the University Malaya campus, and if you don't feel that you're going to offer your program in your satellite campus or in your franchise campus, Okay, then you need to find out from this uh, data whether you have enough 18 year old here at 2023 at that particular locality. Boleh dapat tak? So if the data uh, show and after you get that data, you have to actually now look at uh, some other data on the social demographic not only uh, in terms of feeder, you need to look at in terms of their, remember curriculum is not all about the content, it's also about the learning space. Learning space has a lot to do with the way how they like uh, their life. Huh? Uh, for example, we know that our children nowadays, they like high quality life, they like things to be very easy, this and that. So you need to uh, <clears throat> look at social demographic data and try to identify uh, what is uh, our 18 year old now like okay so that when you design your curriculum you will try to use that data and provide uh, for for whatever that they wish for as well right so that is the social demographic aspect in terms of technology, I think you have seen uh, one of earlier illustrations that I made um, at the beginning of this workshop. You can see that we need to actually look at the technology, not at 2025, but we need to look at the technology when our graduate are working in that particular discipline. We are talking about 2034. <clears throat> So what are the documents or what are the resources that we can actually refer to when it comes to technology in 2034? This is when we need to look at maybe Academy of Science, we need to look at the our own discipline um, industry, right? For example, um, an engineering industry in, 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 and in medical and also dentistry, sports science. You know, you need to find out what are the technologies that in in the making now and and what will be the move 
um, in in the use of technology in future. So we need to find roughly what will be the technology that our graduate is going to be using in 2034 because it has a lot of um, effect on how we design our subject, our program and so on and so on. Are we talking about, for example, in medicine and also in dentistry, are we talking about in future in 2034 our graduate going to use uh, new material in the making because now these people are start talking about this particular material, for example, to uh, to do filling or to do whatever it is, right? Or in medicine as well, there's a lot of new material that people use. Even in medicine, recently, I think in Singapore, uh, one of the doctors came across how they, how they can perform uh, orthopedic surgery much better uh, simply by using a 3D printer model. Uh, it's all started by this particular doctor uh, uh, had, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, had an experience with his son where his son is actually request, requested to him for, uh, for, the, for the child to have a 3D printer, for him to, you know, create something, play with something that is not available in the market. Right, so when he bought a 3D printer for his, his his son, okay, he he noticed that he can actually use okay a 3D printer to to model uh, parts of um, of human bones uh, that need to undergo surgery, uh, and he he innovate such that now their surgery is is much more safer they they can actually use the 3d the, the 3d model uh, that that they print from the 3d printer uh, before the actual operation and that will give them the precise and and pre precise surgery and that will also help them to uh, what we call practice before the actual surgery so you can see that um, Pre previously, people talk about 3D printer. I, I wasn't quite aware of how 3D printer will affect my subject, for example, or how 3D printer will affect my program or my curriculum. But now I have more, um, much better understanding after I've watched that particular <clears throat> um, documentary about how, how, for example, technology, uh, 3D printer, IR 4.0 technology will have an impact to uh, how our graduate going to work. Therefore, if they're going to work in, in, in that um, environment, uh, what we're going to design here will have to prepare them for the technology that they're going to use in 2034. So we need to smell uh, now, what is the technology going to be uh, in future? Okay, it's not really that easy, but uh, the clue is actually there in, in many, many documents. Another thing is economy. Um, here, um, I highly um, recommend each and every one of us, uh, even at the subject level, for us to to be in the know about about. Uh, where do our government put the money into? Into what discipline, into what sector? That is why it is very important. I know that now many people do not watch news anymore. <laughs> they, they, you, they, they read their social media. But um, all I'm saying is that it is worthwhile for us to look at the news, look at uh, what has been signed between our prime minister or our ministry officials with other country, look at where the money is in uh, and check on the... Um, Ministry of Finance, eh, MOF, okay, EPU. Uh, they have the Rancangan Malaysia ke berapa ke berapa. Go and have a read at those and find out which sector, which uh, uh, which discipline that they put the money in, okay. <clears throat> because there is no point for us to apply for a new program or change our existing program into something new if the program is not aligned to where the money is going to be. Okay, that's that's all I'm saying. Okay, 
because you see at the national level, the curriculum committee at the national level, one of them is actually representative from the MOF. So the representative from MOF will have all your documents that you submitted to um, Ministry of Higher Education and they, fr from their data, because they know where the money is going to be, from their data, they will say that um, they will recommend or they will not recommend for approval because there is there will be money or there will no be there will no there will be no money in that particular program. Okay, so before we submit, <clears throat> you must do a little bit of homework, find out where the money is going to be, and uh, environment and nature. How environment and nature affect our curriculum design? Okay. Can I ask you a question? What is the environment and nature problem you think nowadays that is prominent in our country or in the world? What do you think? Hmm. Environment and nature. Kalau kat Pahang saya tahu lah. It's all about flood. Lagi? The global, global warming. warming. Global warming, strong wind, right? Is it true? So there's a lot of changes in environment and nature. So what is the relationship between environment and nature to the program that we're going to offer, to the subject that we are teaching? Okay. It, it looks as if it does not have any connection, but it, it does in all sense, right? For example, um, if we look at the problem of um, flood, if I'm talking about my discipline, that is civil engineering. So the problem with flood every year, people will have to put up and they, 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 they lost a lot of things, right? We, we need to, I think as a civil engineer, we need to come up with, uh, when, when it comes to offering a program, then we need to, even in, in my subject, I need to find out in what way the content of my subject need to be related to blood prevention. In what way we can come up with uh, a new, for example, uh, subject in the program that will address the change in the environment and nature. Okay, so if, for example, our program, a new program that we're going to offer fail to address the environment and nature, for now and future, then our program and subjects will not be relevant during the implementation phase, right? And at that point of time, uh, it will be very, uh, you know, difficult or not convenient for us to make changes, right? So, but macam tadi yang kita kata curriculum review, normally people do once every five years, okay? So if we fail to uh, incorporate the uh, aspect of environmental and nature, we might face problem over here because at that point of time, maybe the environment and nature have already changed. And finally, political legal. Political legal um, is where you also need to find out the uh, uh, about whether or not the program that you would like to offer, okay, um, has any um, disagreement or misalignment with the political and also legal aspect uh, between Malaysia and, for example, the country that you would like to work with. If you would like to offer a program, uh, where you intend to offer a dual degree, for example, um, or you intend to offer the program not in Malaysia, but in um, other country outside Malaysia, you need to find out whether Malaysia is okay with that country or not. <laughs> Uh, why? Because uh, during my time at JPT, we came across um, a few institutions that uh, apply for a new program where their feeders are not Malaysian. They would like that program to be offered in another country, right? Um, 
However, at that point of time, it's not about that country that we are not approving um, that particular program. It was because it is not legal according to the ministry for us to uh, allow that new program to be offered. So this will have an implication to the new program that you are applying. So after you have gone through all the five STEEP aspect, then only you can come up with um, summary of opportunities, challenges, and by then you should be able also to identify this particular person that you're going to produce at 2034. What are their attributes? What are their knowledge, skills, uh, and also uh, competency that they that they should have? Right. So that is roughly what steep analysis is all about. So. Um, where do we get those data in order for, for us to fill in all these five boxes? As I mentioned, we can we can get the data actually from Department of Statistic, okay, as far and also ILMIA as far as um, S is concerned, social demographic. And um, you can also use um, documents or data from the EPU. Uh, it's worthwhile for you to also look at Talent Corp document, um, JPA, Martrait, and some other agencies. Here are just some examples of where the source of data is actually coming from. And here I also provide you with all the QR code for the previous um, briefing given by JPT on uh, what are the talent um, that we require uh, for our country. Uh, in the next five or ten years, right? And these are some of the excerpt from the uh, presentation given by uh, some of those ag agencies that I mentioned uh, during those uh, briefing. Uh, and the purpose of this briefing is to enable all the higher learning institution to foresight uh, whether the new program that you would like to offer is actually needed or is not needed. Okay, this is actually from Perkeso, um, and you can see there, and this is, um, tak ingat lah pula saya ambil excerpt ni daripada mana, but you can see that if you would like to offer, for example, another degree program, please remember that uh, there's not much job in uh, for graduate employability is going to be a problem if you produce more degree program, but actually what we need more is a diploma uh, graduate for our country, right? So you can see uh, all all this data from from the folder that I've given to you. Just gonna show you some of this. Um, <clears throat> if you go to uh, JPT, okay, or Ministry of Higher Education for approval, you will be asked whether you have referred to. Talent Corp document and the document um, that you need to refer is this document, Critical Occup Occupational List. They, they produce this document every year. And in this document, Talent Corp is actually an agency under the Department of um, Prime Minister's Office. And they their job is to use data from DOSERM and also ILMIA to predict what to to find out what are the talents required for Malaysia uh, uh, in the next five years. So you can see that uh, in tel, uh, in that document, uh, the what we call this is what we call the coal list, C O L, critical occupational list. And normally JPT will ask you, have you referred to coal list, and have you actually identify whether the whether the, the name of the job or the graduate that you're going to produce at the end of your program is, is indeed in the code list. If it's not in the code list, basically or normally, JBT will turn down your application. So please make sure you know the MASCO code. Um, there is a, what we call a MASCO code in this particular document and you need to write the MASCO code uh, when you apply for a new program 
uh, from the Ministry of Higher Education. So this document is very, very important indeed. Okay, so these, these are documents from Talent Cup. It shows you uh, what are the industry that uh, we are highly needed and where they are, where they are. Okay, I'm just going to flash through all this data. And as I mentioned, if you know from PTPTN uh, which discipline that will, uh, which discipline that graduate uh, pay back their loan, uh, that will give you an a good indication um, that that particular discipline uh, has good graduate employability. If you apply for a program that falls under that discipline, then very likely is you you're gonna get uh, an approval. For example, if we look here, um, bayaran balik, prestasi bayaran balik. If you look at prestasi bayaran balik, 83%, which is which was the highest at that time, 2019 dulu, was in education. So you can see education ni, people got a lot of jobs in education. For IPTS, for example, science, mathematics, and also com computer used to be the discipline where there's a high return in student uh, paying back their loan, uh, the PTPTN loan. So that shows that graduate from this discipline um, uh, are, are, em are, are employable or, or in employment. All right. So that's how you use that data uh, in your steep analysis and when identifying whether or not the new program that you like to offer um, is indeed needed or they are not needed. Right, these are other data from other presentation that I think you may take time to go through uh, them. Uh, that is why I do not believe that people can um, come up, you know, uh, with initial um, curriculum uh, design uh, within, for example, two weeks or two months. Why? Because if you look at what need to be found, at the planning stage, even uh, if you like to really, you know, uh, do the steep analysis, uh, you need to make reference to a lot of um, actual data. Okay, so it is not really that uh, thing that you can do do very very quickly. So I'm I'm actually quite surprised when some institution or some department when they do curriculum review or when they do um, uh, when they design a new curriculum, it, it they they only took like one or two workshops uh, and they they came up with uh, the curriculum within, for example, two months or even two weeks. So I'm quite surprised how they did that. But um, as far as the actual how we should deal with it, we, we need to be serious about, about all this. For private institution, it's even more important for you to, I think, for, for you to do a proper planning because, because if I can just go back to that process where you need to apply for approval, because if, if for example, your program have been approved by JPT, Okay. And you already got the letter and you then offer your program to the public and after two years, if you do not get any enrollment, then basically your approval will be considered um, tamat tempo lah ataupun luput, okay? meaning that the approval being cancelled. So the maximum time for you to keep your approval uh, before the first student enroll into your program is actually two years. And after two years, if you and if, for example, your you manage to get uh, students within that two years, and let's say because you've done a very poor um, needs analysis, okay, you fail to predict you can get good enough number of feeder to come into your program. If you need to close your program, okay, soon after it has been offered, 
if it's private institution, your you can be fined, and your license can be retracted. So that is how serious it is. So 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 that is that is why um, for public university, although they feel that um, a initial screening is burdensome for them because they have to conduct steep analysis, they will have to answer all those questions uh, here. Yeah. But uh, believe me that if you do not conduct proper needs analysis uh, and if you do not have any student enroll in your program after it has been approved, please remember that the process of getting approval um, requires money because you need to pay for MQA01, you need to pay for workshops, this and that. So after all those resources that you have used, at the end, if you offer a program and you do not have any student, just because you fail to plan and to predict well, then uh, I think it's a big loss to the institution. So for private university, please make sure that you have a committee that will help you to, uh, you know, look um, after uh, all these things uh, because fail to plan is planning to fail. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. After the step analysis, everybody okay with step analysis? Yeah. After step analysis, then I think you can then make a decision. The curriculum committee, okay, can now help your colleagues to make a decision whether the program that you intend to offer is indeed uh, needed or not needed. If you are if you are doing curriculum review after the needs analysis or using the steep analysis as well, you can find out whether your program is still relevant or not relevant. If not relevant, how much changes should you made? So you need to conduct gap analysis there. Then only after that, you will have to identify in what way will I make changes to my uh, existing program. If it's new program, you also need to find out based on the social demographic data, find out where are you going to get your feeder. And if, for example, you know that you're not going to get local students, if you still feel that you need to offer that program, you need to find out which country are you going to sell your program. Okay. And you can see that the, the data from where your feeder is coming from will influence okay the mode of study will influence your program delivery <clears throat> if let's say you cannot get your feeder okay from malaysia and your feeder is actually from other country obviously your program delivery will have to be in an open distance learning right and your mode of study will have to be in, 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 in an appropriate manner. So you can see that uh, all this data will, uh, will help you to find out okay, and to design your program uh, so that um, it, it can be offered in an appropriate manner. Okay, so you can see here during your step analysis, you also need to find out um, if, for example, remember the technology, the ST, the technology, if you, if, for example, University of Malaya do not have the technology, but you need to offer that program, okay? You might want to consider using the 2U to I study mode, okay, where um, the, if, you, if you can identify where the technology uh, is, okay, let's say, the technology is available in this particular company or in this particular country. So you might want to consider designing your program in a 2 you to i mode, where student will spend two years in University of Malaya and the other two years in the industry where the technology is available. And I think nowadays universities are quite, um, uh, you know, quite strict about we spending money in buying new technology or new equipment or make changes in our learning spaces. So our option is to actually look into how we can offer a program 
when we do not have the technology, but we can actually use the technology uh, already there in, in the industry. Okay, so to you to I is your option. And if, for example, your feeder is not local, or if, for example, you are targeting for local feeder, say eh? bagi contoh, eh? I came to, for example, uh, Karang Craft, <clears throat> and they are target. They are they 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 would like to offer diploma program in craft. And when I ask them who is your um, feeder, who is your target? Uh, feeder and they said that their target they still feel that um, their diploma program should should come you know should cater for SPM leavers and I told them you see Malaysia according to social demographic data is becoming negara manua okay negara manua meaning that we have we will be having many people who have um gone through a pension stage and this pensioner you know they have a lot of money they have a lot of time and these are also the people who also love craft and i told them why why don't you change your uh, feeder from just you know aiming for spm levers to for example those pensioners and, and why why can't you for example design a diploma program for for, for pensioners as your target participants. So similarly, for example, in dentistry and also in all other fields as well, I think University Malaya is going for micro-credential. Now you can start looking at your feeder, not necessarily from the diploma or STPM levels, but your feeder can also be from those who are working in the industry, right? So <coughs> that is how the STEP analysis will determine how your program is supposed to be designed, be it in the industry mode or be it in the ODL or micro-credential mode or be it in the physical face-to-face -face mode like so, right? So this is what this slide is, is, is all about. So in the end, what we have discussed so far, right, will allow you to uh, actually fill in the kertas cadangan for you to apply for a new program as what it says in here. And I think if you look at the this particular book on page 60, I think I've opened up this, page 60. I can just go back. 33, page 45. Fifty one. Mm. I lost it. Page sixty. Okay, this is a new program. This is actually the uh, template for a uh, new program proposal that you need to fill in and for you to submit to the Ministry of Higher Education for the um, initial screening. And you can see that those that we have done in the steep analysis will need to be put in not syarat kemasukan, bukan hasil pembelajaran on 17 onwards, right? Justifikasi mengadakan program akademik. So here it says that unjuran statistik keperluan pekerjaan. So this is where you need to look at the talent corp data. And also, and you can see here that you need to look at the labor force survey and so on and so on. So for private university, you would like to also use uh, all similar templates for you to be able to get a winning um, proposal to GPT. Right. Is there any questions so far? At the planning stage? Because we are ready to now look at how do we uh, go into a subject curriculum design and delivery. 
that the k. If there is no question, um, just need to check on the time. Do we need a five minute break again? Yeah? Yes, no? Yeah. Ada question, Ada question dekat, dekat chat box. Chat box. Boleh bacakan tak umur? Um, what will happen if a new, a new PG, PG program, program offer, offer mm -hmm. has no has or very low no student intake? Right. Um, it will be a loss to the institution because you see the uh, the flow that I show you and the, con the ministry will not control the postgraduate program. For postgraduate program, all that you need to do is you apply for, for approval and the ministry will approve dan, dan hanya direkodkan sebagai pemakluman, bukan kelulusan. For postgraduate program, we said that it's all yours, it's up to you. So if you if you don't do a proper planning, if you don't foresight, if you don't get students, it's your loss. Uh, however, for for private university, as I mentioned, um, all those those controls that I I described to you, it's it's for the diploma and also degree program. For postgraduate program, ministry won't have a say. Cuma university akan rugi lah. The, the, the university will run into lost. Because during the uh, during the defend uh, session at the Ministry of Higher Education as well, actually all uh, university will have to show how do you, at what year do you reach the break even point. Okay. And you need to uh, prove that you can reach that break even point actually. Hmm. Thank you for the question. Yes, for postgraduate program, I actually we come across uh, quite a number of um, public university. Uh, Bakobai offer a new postgraduate program and after two years, they run into a problem, dia tak dapat student. So bila tak dapat student, they will have to close the program. Because if you do not close the program, you still have to pay for the, you know that after the approval, your program will be recorded in the Malaysian Qualification Registry, the MQR, right? So you you will also be given the uh, MQA punya license. Eh? So if you, if for example, you do not have any student, you do not generate any more income, okay, and you still have to pay for the MQA license and the program will still have to go through all this accreditation uh, it will involve a lot of money so so normally those who's, who's in charge of all this curriculum will be very you know um penting lah dengan keadaan ni sebab tu yang tadi planning stage tu is normally people don't do and they don't do well and they run into problem actually i came across quite a lot of Master's program lah kebanyakannya macam tu. It is a loss to the university. And please remember that the university funding um, uh, is coming from the ministry. Uh, walaupun ministry tak kawal eh, postgraduate program, tetapi um, saya rasa the honesty eh, uh, for us to use public money and fail to plan properly and run into a loss is is unfair it's unfair right ada lagi tak soalan umur is there any more question uh, no more in this no more eh? okay has everybody got a chance to take a little bit of um, stretch and another drink so we have another hour to go right okay now we are ready to go into the subject level and go a little bit more detail uh, and um, at this stage we are ready to go into how do we formulate for example PEO, PLO and, and even the higher uh, than this is actually the program goal. Okay, right. 
so this is these two slides are just revision of what the system look like okay and at this stage when we are ready to when we know that we need to offer this new program we are ready to design the program and the subject right and these are all the references that you need before you begin to design your program or your subject okay okay first of all at the development stage, now we are going into the development stage of curriculum design and delivery, second stage. Eh? What we need to do is we need to what we call articulate the program philosophy and state the program goal. This is the OBE big picture diagram. Okay. However, in the GGP of curriculum design and delivery, there is a... Um, what we call a bullet saying that you must start with stating your program philosophy and program goal. Where do you think program philosophy and program goal situated in this bigger picture? And what are they? Anybody like to try? <coughs> Does it matter? Program goal and program philosophy. Or when we design new program or when we review existing program, we straight away start into PEO, writing PEO, ignoring the program philosophy and program goal. Chenna, what do you think? When I come to QUT, I actually ask some of my colleagues at QUT and I ask them, how, how do you take into consideration uh, your university mission vision or your program philosophy? Um, and many people are actually not aware of it, right? I said, um, QUT having a motto of um, real, real, real world university and I said how real world university motto translate into your subject translate into your program not many people able to answer such question okay for your information okay before we design a program or a subject we whether we like it or not we need to be aware of what is our university or program philosophy and also program goal so what are they okay university melaya punya program philosophy tahu tak apa dia university melaya hmm, soalan cepu mas ni okay Kalau kita tak aware, if we are not aware of our university uh, or our program philosophy, we need to ask ourselves, are we aware that each and every public university in Malaysia has been found uh, for a particular or a unique purposes? Purpose. Yeah? For example, University Melayu ditubuhkan atas dasar untuk apa? For example, University of Malaysia Fahang ditubuhkan atas dasar untuk apa dan kenapa dia berada di pantai timur. Okay, all those, okay, has been stated in satu dokumen yang dinamakan Perintah Pemerbadanan. Okay, yang ada di pejabat, pejabat apa? Pejabat guam di universiti masing-masing eh, sebenarnya. Um, why? Because sebenarnya every university founded eh, uh, in Malaysia or in other parts of the world has been determined uh, its particular purpose by the founder. Kalau dekat Malaysia, public university by uh, perintah pembadanan itu ditandatangani oleh yang dipertuan agung. Okay. So for example, University Malaya function should not duplicate, for example, UKM or UPM function, right? Because you have been given the um, role, uh, what you need to do for the country, okay? So, 
you need to understand this program philosophy, be, be, uh, this philosophy, why your university has been uh, founded, because you have to, when you design your program, you have to uphold this philosophy. For example, eh, I came across private university, um, Saito, okay? Uh, the founder is Japanese. Similarly, there's another university, a uh, New Era University, if I'm not mistaken, in KL, uh, founded from endowment of Chinese um, community. So when those universities have been founded, their punya founder has already have an intention why those universities being founded. They have certain values, belief system that they want that university to uphold and to deliver. So imagine when we teach a subject, if we do not deliver the, the, the actual intention of the founder, we have failed to deliver uh, that original intention. Why is it matter? Because it matters because eh, all your program will be designed using the, the, the MQF and also COPA. Right, so what differ your program from one university to another? I give an example. Uh, medical program or civil engineering program or dentistry program is offered by University of Malaya, is offered by UKM, is offered by USM, is offered by UPM, right? However, what differ this programs is academic programs from one another okay they should differ by the program philosophy for example university of malaya graduate that come from that program that has been designed by university of malaya must be graduate who embrace research because University of Malaya has been has been has been founded and has been given the mandate to be strong in research, right? Whereas other universities have different mandate. So all I'm saying is that program philosophy have a lot to do with how you design your program and how a subject need to be designed because we need to uphold the actual intention of why that university being founded, and this will give a different DNA to your graduate. So. Graduate from, for example, eh, medical faculty uh, of University of Malaya, okay, will be different from graduate from medical faculty from University uh, Antarabangsa Islam Malaysia, UIA, UIA, UIAM, right? Because the because the uh, the philosophy of UIA and the philosophy of University of Malaya is different. If you look, if you look at, to, kalau tak percaya, eh, kalau you all tengok, eh, the, if you look at the, the, the graduate from UIA, from the same program, and graduate from Universal, they are different. Okay, so, so whether we realize it or not, actually when we design a program, we need to embrace the university mission vision, the university um, philosophy into our program. What about program goal? Uh, program goal. This is an example of how program goal is written, right? Program goal ada berapa? Saya nak tanya. How, how, how many program goal are there? For a program, there will be how many program goal? Siapa nak cuba jawab? What do you think? Program goal. Anybody? Goal should, goal should only be one. Goal should only be? One. One. Okay. Thank you. When you play football, one team have one goal post. Right? Um, so, program goal is the person that you would like to produce. For example, if you are uh, dealing with dentistry program, obviously you would like to produce a dentist, right? If it's a civil engineering program, you would like to produce a civil engineer. If it's a medical program, you would like to produce medical officer, okay? But what type of 
civil engineer, medical officer or dentist that you would like to produce. Okay. And how their attributes is governed by your university mission, vision, philosophy and all that will all be stated um, in the program goal like so. So you can see here, this is an example of a write-up of a program goal. The person, the one person that you would like to produce in this example is actually this. The um, medical imaging officer. Medical imaging practitioner. Okay. With all these attributes. Right. Okay. Um, so there's only one program goal. Okay, after you have identified that program goal, you are then ready to write your program educational objective. May I just ask how many program educational objective statements should you write? Normally in a document. Seven, seven. Hmm, good try. Lower values than that? Three. PEO, three to four statement. Oh, oh, I oh, oh. goes with PO. And PO? PO is uh, seven. Uh, seven. Okay. We have, if you look at MQF, how many learning outcome are they? Five. The new MQF have five clusters, but 11 learning outcome. Mm. Right? You can see now numbers are increasing. 1, 3, 11. How many CO should there be in a subject? Maximum. Three. Sorry, maximum? Three. Three. Yes, University Malaya said that it is, you know, advisable for you to have maximum three learning outcome. Okay, and in a program, you have many, many, many subjects. Let's say you have like 30 subjects. You can see that number is now increasing. Altogether, you have like 90 learning outcome. Okay, let's have a look at how do we craft this so-called PEO and why is it that PEO have actually three to four statements altogether? I think first of all, what we need to do is we need to see this one person that we would like to produce at the end of the program, uh, not at the end of the program, this is actually, in fact, PEO onwards is actually the alumni. This is the person that you would like to produce in 2034. Okay, so curriculum committee, your job is that you need to make sure that when you would like to decide who this person going to be, you need to make sure that everybody is involved because this picture, this big picture need to be shared by everybody because each and every lecturer will have the job to create this big picture at the end of the day. So if, for example, each and every lecturer who involved in delivering the subject in a program do not or fail to see this big picture, this big picture will not be generated. Okay, as simple as that. Okay, so let's have a look at what tools can we use to see this person. Okay, the 2034 person. We are going to transform this diploma student at the entry level into this person that we're going to describe in our goal. Right. So this is when I would like to introduce you to what we call the industry landscape uh, template. OK, what is there in the template just now in the Steve analysis? We have already uh, got some clues on what are the attributes of this person. Right. Uh, but in this uh, template, we will get even more specific about the attributes of this person that we're going to produce. And this template has, um, we start from here actually, has uh, companies, technologies, jobs, career development, therefore what are the skills needed 
that we need to prepare our students so that they become the person that will function in that particular industry. Right, so we can see here, I put the timeline as 2030. Just now we mentioned that this is 2034. So let's have a look at what industry landscape is all about. So industry landscape is about, we have to identify which company that they're going to work with or identify the industry that they're going to join after they completed the program that we intend to offer, right? And I think I've mentioned to you that GPT will normally ask you name the company that your graduate will work with, okay? And what you need to do is after you have identified the industry and specific company that your graduate will work with after they completed the program that you're going to offer, you need then to find out what will be the technology that they will be involved in using when they work in 2034. 